Ladies and gentlemen, friends, brothers and sisters, it's a great pleasure to welcome you tonight to Virginia Theological Seminary. My name's Ian Markham. I have the privilege of being the Dean and President here. And this is part of an important program, in my judgment, perhaps the most important program that we do here at the seminary, as we think afresh about the relationship between peoples in this country and in this world, and the obligation on us all to recognize our propensities for sinfulness and participation in sinful structures, and the way in which white dominance and white racism has crippled in so many ways so much of this globe. So thank you for coming tonight. A uh, very warm welcome to those who are on the live stream. I'm very pleased you've joined us. I want to recognize uh, that we have the privilege of having at the campus over the last few days the Board of the Union of Black Episcopalians. I'm going to ask them please to stand so we can recognize your presence in our midst. One privilege of having our friend and colleague, uh, the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams, as our speaker, is we take real delight in the relationship that she has facilitated and participates in with one of the most important African American congregations in the region and in the country. So, if you're from Alpha Street Baptist Church, do you mind just standing so we can recognize you, please? I do want people to know that this is a continuing conversation at this school. Uh, it cannot and never must be simply two days. And therefore, do please be aware that on April the 11th at 7 o'clock in the multi-purpose room, which is the other side of the campus in Addison, there will be a screening of the uh, documentary film, Backs Against the Wall, The Howard Thurman Story. And actually, the best way to register for that is to go to our Facebook page and click on events, and then that's the easiest way to make sure that you participate and are active in that uh, opportunity of that screening. Um, gosh, I'm in the light. We might need to move it just a little, except the sun moves as well, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this thing's heavy. Okay, right. So I'm doing that. So prepare yourself, uh, Bishop-elect Rofe. And um, uh, do you know, one last thing I want to just say is that um, in the end, we have a changing America, and therefore we must have a changing church and therefore raising up vocations of color really matter. And if you know anybody who would be interested in studying at Virginia Theological Seminary, we really do invite you to reach out and invite them to talk to our admissions office. Uh, we've got a whole host of imaginative products which are virtually cost-free, which we would love you to participate in because the future of the church depends on us raising up leadership that reflects the country we're called to serve. And it's an imperative that we continue to raise up vocations, and that's a responsibility on all of us. So if you can please think about that and pray about that and facilitate and enter into conversations. And if you're a Baptist, we would love to have you. <laughs> and finally, I just want to say what an extraordinary privilege it is to welcome our vice chair of the board. Um, it was in 2008, at my first commencement as dean and president of the institution, Phoebe Rofe uh, was graduating. It was an extraordinary year because she collected three of the so-called six prizes uh, that were available to graduating seniors. And it really does reflect on her extraordinary skill, competence, and love of the church, and love of our Lord, that's radiated through her faith and ministry ever since. 
and uh, I'm delighted she'll introduce our speaker tonight. But I invite you now, please, to give a very warm welcome to Bishop-elect Phoebe Rofe. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for that warm greeting, brothers and sisters. Uh, but we're really here to celebrate another outstanding woman. This is Judy Fentress Williams evening and not mine, but I certainly uh, do thank you for the very warm welcome. Uh, BTS is home to me. Uh, I love this institution. It plays such a pivotal role in shaping uh, just the, the scope and the arc of my ministry thus far. So it's my privilege to not only serve as vice chair of the board, but to introduce our guest speaker this evening, the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. If you go to Virginia Theological Seminary's website, you can find Judy's complete resume. Five pages, by the way. <laughs> so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the things that you can find on her resume, including all of her phenomenal academic accomplishments. Instead, I would like to give you a sense of Judy, the person who has served diligently at this institution since 2002. So what are the words that I would use to describe Judy? I would start with thoughtful. She brings a great thoughtfulness to everything she undertakes. Judy is also dedicated. She never gives up on her students. She is an encourager, especially when times get tough. And for all of us who walk around with these white plastic collars, you don't get through seminary without hitting some wilderness phases. And so Judy is an encourager. Judy is challenging. She pushes her students beyond the superficial responses or analysis of the Hebrew scriptures. She expects a lot of her students, and yet she's compassionate. She cares deeply, and it just radiates from her in her classes. Judy is generous. For these past, what, 17 years, she has opened her heart and her home to seminarians from all over the country, indeed throughout the Anglican communion. What a phenomenal example of radical hospitality. It goes without saying that she's very intelligent. God gifted Judy with an awesome brain, and she uses it to the best of her abilities. She is a visionary. I hope that you will have an experience of that this evening, and that she presents uh, the Hebrew scriptures in a way which may challenge some of your understandings. And if that's the case, I ask you to hang with her. Don't immediately say, well, just stay with her and allow her to make her full argument before you reach your conclusion. But above all, I would say that Judy is a woman of very deep faith. Her love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ undergirds everything she does. It is truly the lens through which she lives and moves and has her being. 
So quite simply, brothers and sisters, our guest speaker this evening is truly a phenomenal woman of God. And so it is my honor and privilege to introduce the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. nothing else goes right, I can say I was introduced by Bishop-elect Phoebe <laughs> Rofe. We're off to a great start. I want to thank Dean and President of the Seminary, Dean Ian Markham, and Melody Knowles, Dean of the Faculty. And I'd like to thank the Reverend Joseph Thompson, Director of Multicultural Ministries here at the Seminary for the invitation to speak tonight. It is an honor to participate in the celebration of the life and work of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and those who toiled and continue to do so in support of civil rights for all. We assemble here this evening as beneficiaries of those who left class to sit at lunch counters. Dr. Garrett is sitting right here, and she is someone who left Bennett College to sit at a lunch counter. We're the beneficiaries of those who endured or died from physical violence, those who tolerated insults, being called out of their names, dismissed, or ignored. A central tenet of African culture is the acknowledgement and honoring of ancestors. And just this past weekend, I was able to participate in a program that commemorated the 30th anniversary of women called Womanists gathering at Howard University in 1998. So I stand here tonight also as beneficiaries of those courageous women. And I have to tell you, this happens every time a new Marvel movie comes out. I stop and say, what a good time to be alive. And I stand here tonight thinking about those that have paved the way and have enabled me to be here, and I think, what a great time to be alive. The title for tonight's lecture is Remembering Dina and Her Sisters, the Black Church and the Me Too Movement. This approach is going to incorporate two related methodologies. They are womanist hermeneutics and intersectionality. So first, let's just def define the term. So we're more or less on the same page. First term, womanist, comes from Alice Walker's seminal work in search of our mother's gardens. And the word womanist, she says, comes from the term womanish. Um, it's the opposite of girlish. It's a black feminist of color. It comes from a black folk expression, girl, you act in womanish. It means that you are acting like a woman when you're not supposed to. And so it refers to outrageous, audacious, courageous, or willful behavior. It's applied to those who want to know more and in greater depth than is considered good for one. These are people who are interested in grown-up doings and being grown up. This term also applies to a woman who loves other women, sexually and non-sexually committed to the survival and wholeness of the entire people, male and female. A womanist is not a separatist, except on occasion when needed, but traditionally someone who is a universalist, as in, Mama, I'm walking to Canada and I'm taking you and a bunch of slaves with me. And the reply would be, it wouldn't be the first time. A womanist loves music, loves to dance, loves the moon, loves the spirit. Here in this, the sense of embodiment. Loves food and roundness. Loves struggle, loves the folk, and loves herself 
regardless. And finally, she says, womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. That's y'all's first time hearing that? <laughs> okay. The term womanist showed up in religious studies when black women, students at Union Theological Seminary, challenged the black liberation theology that did not include them. Here are the names of these doctoral students. Jacqueline Grant, Katie Geneva Cannon, Dolores Williams, and Kelly Brown Douglas. They insisted upon acknowledging a tri-dimensional oppression of gender, race, and class. And that insistence led them to embrace the term womanist to identify the work they would do in religious studies. That discourse then went to the American Academy of Religion and the Society for Biblical Literature, where we lift up the names of people like Cheryl Townsend Jilks, Clarice Martin, and Renita Weems. A womanist approach to scripture often focuses on the themes of gender and sexuality, agency and advocacy, foregrounding women on the margins, and illuminating children and childhood. Mitzi Smith contends that womanist readings of scripture are relevant and contextual in their biblical interpretation, that it attempts to expose and condemn oppression and violence in sacred texts and contexts. She argues that when we turn a blind eye to biases and violence in our texts and in our contexts, the likelihood is great that we will learn to internalize that oppression and read as oppressed people rather than as a people who value and seek freedom for ourselves and others. We will be traumatized people who traumatize others. So a womanist reading is a liberating reading that is holistic, contextual, critical, and embodied. And I want you to hear those last two adjectives together, critical alongside contextual or alongside embody is tricky in biblical studies because historically, critical work was presented as something that was objective and disembodied, all right? A womanist reading dismantles this myth with its insistence that the work that is presented is both contextual and criticism. And by insisting on this, it exposes the, the fact that all scholarship is contextual. Everybody operates from a particular context, a worldview, an imaginative framework. It's just that prior to the biblical fields becoming more diverse, everybody came from the same place, almost literally from the same place. A womanist approach takes the tools of interpreting texts and assembles them so that they seek out the aforementioned themes of gender and sexuality, agency and advocacy, foregrounding women on the margins and illuminating children and childhood. The second term that needs defining is intersectionality. Intersectionality is a term that was named and developed by black feminists. Intersectionality is the recognition of the simultaneity, simultaneity, there it is, of multiple social identities within interlocking systems of oppression. Hear this, people experience always and at once their gender, race, sexual identity, ability, age, social class, nation, and religion. These are intertwined identities, and they locate us in relation to structures of power and domination. You were never just a woman. You were never just a person of color. You were never just queer. You were never just poor. You are always all of these things. Intersectionality is a problem-solving approach that highlights multiple identities. Which means that at any given time, we have multiple relations to power. That we can be oppressed and oppressor at the same time.
in the same way that a womanist approach insists on wholeness, intersectional readings pay attention to the narrative and the counter-narrative, or as my students would have heard me say in Bible, the tradition and the counter-tradition. And the core concepts of intersectionality would be social inequality, power, relationality, social context, complexity, and social justice. So what I offer this evening is a reading, or more accurately, multiple readings of a passage that will demonstrate how the perspectives that we use to interpret a text shape our findings. And if we approach the text from more than one angle and we can entertain more than one reading, we can engage in a theological dialogue that is liberating for some, even if not all, of our multiple identities. So we take as our point of departure a verse from the Joseph narrative. Now, I know you all remember that we have in Genesis chapters 12 through 50, this block of material that we call the ancestral narrative it starts with Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, you know, yes, nah, that's right. And then we have Isaac and um, Rebecca and then Jacob and Leah and Rachel and Zilpah and Bilha. We've got a whole lot of people that come in this narrative and that takes us down to the story of Joseph. So in the story of Joseph, in chapter 37, we have the story of this young man, Joseph, who's identified as the favorite of his father, Jacob. And the favoritism is evidenced by what? The coat, he got some kind of coat, um, long sleeve coat um, that is presented to Jacob because the way to endear the favorite to the rest of the siblings is to continue to show them favoritism. Um, <laughs> the older brothers are jealous and they come up with a scheme to get rid of him. They sell him as a slave to the Midianites, strip him of his coat and dip it into goat's blood. Then they present the coat to Jacob Note the irony here. Jacob, who uses a garment to deceive his own father, is now being deceived by his sons who use a garment. They present it to him and say, this is what we found. See if this is your son's coat or not. Jacob takes the bait and he cries out, it is my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Now I want you to look at the next two verses. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and all his daughters sought to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. Here in this image of Jacob in tremendous grief, so much so that he cannot be comforted by his other children, we encounter the phrase, all his sons and all his daughters. Now, we know Jacob has other sons, but to our knowledge, he only has one daughter, and her name is Dina. Chapters 29 through 30 give us the births of Jacob's children with Leah, his first wife, Rachel, the beloved second wife, Zilpah, the slave of Leah, Bilhah, the slave of Rachel. The account is set up in this network of rivalry. Leah bears Jacob's sons each time, hoping she will gain her husband's love and favor. Renita Weems writes a beautiful article about this. Rachel, the beloved wife, experiences the anguish of her infertility and resorts to giving Jacob her slave girl, Bilhah, who bears sons on her behalf. And then Leah, not to be outdone, offers Jacob her slave girl, who also bears sons for Jacob. And then finally, Rachel has a son of her own, whom she promptly names Joseph, meaning may the Lord add to me another son. Once again, conveying the values she and her sister have adopted in their quest to win in this governing system. Please note that the context that tells women their value is tied to their ability to bear sons makes them complicit in the oppression of each other, their slaves, and themselves. 
The baby race is just about over by the end of chapter 30. Leah is the mother of six sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and one daughter named Dina. Also included in her tally are sons, um, Zilpah's sons, Gad and Asher. She has a total of eight. Rachel claims the two children of her slave Bilhah, Dan and Naphtali, and then she gives birth to Joseph, and later on in the narrative, dies in childbirth as Ben-Oni, who is later named Benjamin, is born. According to the text, Jacob has 12 sons and one daughter. So what are we going to do with this reference, all his sons and all his daughters? I've got three possibilities. Option one, responds to the text as a historical document, which means that we consider what is most likely or what is possible in the known world. So Gerhard von Rod suggests that this is a reference to his daughters-in-law. It's good, right? This is an easy solution. It's viable and reasonable. So that the daughters referred to then would be daughters-in-law. Option two is to acknowledge the text as a literary document. This is usually my go-to. These possible, this option then would look at these words as poetic in some fashion. So maybe the phrase all of his sons and all of his daughters is a figure of speech, a poetic way of saying all of the kids, right? You've got that nice parallelism. So that is a real possibility. In the same vein, the phrase could make reference to his children and the unborn descendants that they represent, all right? Option three. The intersectional and womanist reading takes into account the social context and its complexities. It takes its interpretive cues from power dynamics, social inequality, and relationality. Maybe Jacob has sons by Zilpah and Bilhah. And maybe the co-wives, sons count but perhaps in a hierarchical system, their daughters don't count. Was there less concern about the husbands of these daughters and less energy um, invested in protecting their sexuality? A womanist reading of the text remembers slave masters who had children by slave women who were never acknowledged. They weren't counted or put in the official family record, but it is possible that they knew who their father was and would have mourned in some way his death. Or maybe there are other daughters that belong to Zilpah and Bilhah and Leah and Rachel, but they are not mentioned because their stories are of no consequence. And the only reason Dina's story is mentioned is because she is the daughter who has this encounter with an uncircumcised man in chapter 34. We know her name and her story because she threatens the honor of the family. We know her name because she mattered to the storyteller who is one who is trying to create an identity for Jacob and his descendants. Whether there are actual other daughters or not, the reference to Jacob's daughters evokes the unnamed women of his household and our households in all of our societal structures. The reference invites us to consider the marginalized unnamed sisters of Dinah from every generation. Before there was a Tarana Burke or a Me Too movement, we have in Genesis 34, Dina's story, which comes to us at the intersection of sex, gender, ethnicity, and class under the rubric of God's promise to Abraham and his descendants. I'm going to invite you to look at the chapter with me, but before we do, we just want to make note of the chapter that proceeds and follows, because we all know that's a good exegetical method, yes? Um, we want to look at the context, and right now I just want to lift up the immediate context. In the preceding chapter, chapter 33, Jacob reconciles with his brother Esau and then travels to Shechem where he buys a plot of land and builds an altar. In the following chapter, Jacob travels to Bethel. 
the family puts away their foreign idols. And in this chapter, we have another account of Jacob's name change from Jacob to Israel and the erection of a pillar and a sacrifice. So the story of Dina is in the middle of stories about two lands, Shechem and Bethel. It's about authentic worship and the putting away of the practices of other nations represented in these foreign isles. What I want to do is quickly read through chapter 34, which you have on your handout. It's also going to be on the screen. There is also a copy of the Hebrew text going around for those who would like to take a look at it. I'm going to try my best to read without commentary. <laughs> now Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the region. When Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the region, saw her, he seized her and lay with her by force. And his soul was drawn to Dina, daughter of Jacob. He loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl to be my wife. Now Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dina, but his sons were with his cattle in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him, just as the sons of Jacob came in from the field. When they heard of it, the men were indignant and very angry because he had committed an outrage in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. For such a thing ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The heart of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall live with us and the land shall be open to you. Live and trade in it and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, let me find favor with you and whatever you say to me, I will give. But the put the marriage present and gift as high as you like and I will give whatever you ask me. Only give me the girl to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah, Dina. And they said to him, we cannot do this to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you that you will become as we are and every male among you be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters for ourselves and we will live among you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his family. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of the city saying, these people are friendly with us. Let us live in the land and trade in it for the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will they agree to live among us, to become one people, that every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their animals be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will live among us. And all who went out of the city gate heeded Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. On the third day, when they were still in pain, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city unawares and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. And the other sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and made their prey. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few. And if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. 
But they said, should our sister be treated like a whore? The heading of this story in many of your Bibles is the rape of Dina. So, what happened to Dina? I want to make some observations. There's a whole lot in this text, so I can only point out a few things. But this is a great opportunity for you to go and do some more Bible study. <laughs> the whole story begins with Dina going out. Out from the home co compound and out from under the protection of the family. She's not condemned for this in the text, and her reason for going out is to visit with the women in the city. A woman going to visit with other women is not problematic on its own, but if you go back to Alice Walker's definition, it's a little womanish. She's acting like she's grown. And as a side note, we should, we should remember that ancient interpreters used this element of the story to promote the sequestering of women, keeping them within and in the realm of the household because of what happened when Dina went out. Let's look a little closer at the language of the story. Dina went out to visit, and here the word is literally she went out to see the women, and while there, she was seen. Dina went out to see, but she was seen. So she moves from being subject to object. She's seen by Prince Shechem, who acted upon her with a series of verbs. He saw her, he took her, he lay with her, and he humbled her. So here, if you look on your sheet, I have underneath the NRSV two other translations of verse 2. Jewish Publication Society says he saw her, he took her, and lay with her, and humbled her. And then in the CEB, the, count, the country's prince saw her, he took her, slept with her, and humiliated her which is in contrast to what we have in the NRSV, which says, lay with her by force, okay? So we get this series or this list of verbs. Now, I wanna separate them out because we're just gonna take he saw her and put that aside. That that's just happens all the time. Um, but what's interesting is what comes next. He took her. Um, this verb, lakach, can be used in a variety of ways. What I want to say is that it is commonplace for men in the Bible to see and take and lay with women. Sometimes the verb for take will appear in an account of rape. In the Tamar Amnon story, Amnon takes Tamar, Lakach. In Deuteronomy 22, 25, it's also used, this verb lakach, is used to describe the assault of an engaged woman in a field where there is no one to hear her cry out. This is one of the few times you can actually be raped in the Bible. You're engaged in a field where no one can hear you cry out. All right? However, there are other places in the Bible where taking of wives appears to be acceptable. In Genesis 38, in the story of Judah and Tamar, Judah sees the daughter of a certain Canaanite. He saw her, Ra'ah, he took her, Lakach, and then he went into her, which is, of all of the ways people can have sexual relations, the, the, the least, um, um, that's pretty straightforward and graphic. Okay, <laughs> he's trying to say. There's no question what happened there. So, um, and in Ruth chapter 4, Boaz, Lakah, took Ruth. All right, so there are places where the taking is not necessarily a bad thing, which means it's not necessarily the taking of a woman as wife that's the offense, but perhaps how it happens or who does the taking. We have, in addition to um, go into, Bo, the um, verbs yada, to know, or shakav, which we have in this instance, to sleep with or to lie with. 
Those verbs, to know, to go into, to sleep with, are within the realm of acceptable encounters on their own. So we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to navigate this text? The signal that something is amiss in Shechem's encounter with Dina is the final verb, ana, translated in some things as he humiliated her, or in other texts, in combination with the verb shakav to imply rape. The concept of the word ana is one of bowing down or afflicting, which is used to get us to that translation by force in the New Revised Standard Version. In order to get that, you need to read the last verb, ana, as modifying the one before it. He slept with her in this way. The other option is to see the verbs in sequence in order of occurrence. First he saw, then he took, then he slept with, and in so doing, humiliated her. That word ana can connote shame. So now the interpreter must decide what exactly is shameful or humiliating in this account. If the word ana modifies the verb shakab to sleep with, then we construe that he forced himself upon her and raped her. This is the argument that Tammy Schneider makes. She says Dina is definitely raped based on her reading of the last verb. Tamara Cohn Eskenazi and Andrea Weiss in the women's Torah commentary argue differently, citing that even the biblical rape laws were primarily concerned with the social status consequences that come from sleeping with a virgin without marrying her or compensating her father. Shechem orders to marry Dina, which would have afforded her full status as a wife in his household. The issue here then might be about the status of Jacob's daughter and the, main, the maintenance of the family line. And we see this in a lot of the Midrashim around Dina, which are obsessed with who she marries eventually, who her children are. Right? So that, that seems to be the emphasis then again around the family line. The work of translation forces us to confront the challenges of language and the cultures that produce them. To what extent does the language of a people carry the assumptions and convictions of a people? How does one translate rape in the absence of a single, clear, one-word equivalent? How should language take into the account the fact that unwanted sexual contact is fairly commonplace in the ancient world? Ancient Near Eastern culture is what we would call rape culture. The Bible lays out a process by which a man can make things right after he sleeps with a virgin in Exodus 22:16 and Deuteronomy 22:28 28 to 29. We cannot talk about what happened to Dina without discussing the cultural context. And we cannot talk about the cultural context outside of the politics of the Israelite identity. The Israelites, as you all know, are a people called by God. And the ancestral narratives are the first in a series of narratives that have the function of constructing a communal identity. In other words, these stories work to establish, preserve, and maintain identity. Woven throughout the stories are principles about God, worship, and the boundaries of kinship. Remember, the initial story of creation in Genesis 1 has us coming from the same ancestry. We all have common source. That means that all of humanity is related. And that means the calling of a people will demand the construction of a people. The Israelites are a construct. They must be separated out from everyone else. The Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, they all have to go. And in the stories, they are systemically cut away 
And that construct of Israelite identity has implications for marriage. The chosen people cannot marry outside of their kinship groups. And Shechem is an outsider. And so one question that must be asked is, is there language for consensual sex between an Israelite and an outsider? Do we even have vocabulary for that? Womanist readings remind us that in our own country, not too long ago, the language used to describe sexual relations between the descendants of Africans and those under the construct of white carried the weight of cultural biases. Until very recently, there was one word for a black man having sex with a white woman. It was rape. White women who secretly engaged in mutual sexual relationships with black men always had the option of claiming that they were being raped if they were caught. We need to know that history so that you understand why the hashtag I believe her is fraught for, with difficulty. Okay? Our interconnectedness means that in our recent past, some hers have had more agency than others. And we don't want to repeat the historical mistake of believing one population over another, lest we return to the world that allowed a woman who was offended by Emmett Till to start a series of events that resulted in the loss of his life. Just last night, I was um, turned on television and saw um, Ken Burns's, a part of the end of Ken Burns' piece on the Central Park Five. This young, the group of five young men who were falsely accused and imprisoned for um, gang raping a woman. And what was interesting, again, was if you think about vocabulary, language was created to describe what they did. Wilding is a term that came out of that series of events. They were called a wolf pack, right? So when we think about language, language carries with it cultural assumptions of the people in any um, community. So when it comes to black men and white women, our lang we have vocabulary. Conversely, there was no language for a white man having sex with a black woman. It was a thing unacknowledged and or joked about. And biracial children of blacks and whites were called mulattoes, a term derived from mule, the offspring of a horse and a donkey, something that cannot reproduce. Our language reflects attitudes around sexuality as an expression of our racial politics. And we cannot forget that when we read the story of Dina. It's never just about gender. So now I want to ask us to think about refining the question from what happened to Dinah to asking where is the offense? Does this verb, ana, to humiliate, speak of humiliation or shame that comes from the fact that Shechem is an outsider? someone other than, and therefore someone less than, the members of Dina's family? This uncircumcised prince's rape of Dina brings disgrace to her brothers, which compels them to take revenge against the perpetrator and his family. Her rape and dishonor preclude the possibility of a more honorable endogamous marriage. This kind of a reading draws on what we call a shame-honor culture. We're mindful of a society where honor is something that only men can attain, but women are the commodities that can be conduits or impediments to the achieving of honor. Women exist in the roles of wife, mother, daughter, and sexual object. She is a possession and the way she honors or dishonors her husband is tied to her behavior, the way she manages her household, and her sexual fidelity. In this world, there are only two types of women, the good women and who bring honor to their husbands and bad women who do not. 
So it stands to reason then that if Jacob's other daughters were good, that they did not need to be mentioned. The ordered and hierarchical world depends on women and, women and men occupying these separate spheres. The family structure is defined with men on top and women in supporting roles. But in this world, daughters are burdens because their very existence creates opportunity for shame. They can be barren or disagreeable wives or unchaste daughters or unmarried. For these reasons, women's sexuality is to be controlled and feared at all costs. If we consider the possibility that Dina was raped and that that is the offense, or we consider the possibility that the offense has to do with the nationality or otherness of Shechem, I want to raise the possibility that whether the offense is rape or it is the shame, that there is sufficient linguistic evidence to confirm that the first offense, the initial violence that happens to Dina, is the fact that she is property in the first place. She is taken and given, she is bartered over, and she is the conveyor of pride or shame. She is the daughter of Jacob, the object of Shechem's desire, sister to Simeon and Levi, and she is Leah's girl. But there is no autonomy, and she does not speak for herself. The young men, Shechem and Dina's brothers, Simeon and Levi speak, and their comments treat Dina as an object. But Dina's voice is missing. We do not know Dina's perspective in any of these events, and so we are left at our respective intersections, reading into the gaps of the story. And if we are not careful, we will find ourselves trying to possess her as well, so that we can use her story for our respective platforms. The story is complicated, and it alerts us to the problem of not hearing her voice. Without that, we can lay claim to her like centuries of interpreters, condemning her for going outside of the house, describing her as a victim or survivor of rape, or thinking of her as the one who brings shame to her father's house, or as the reason her brothers massacre the men of the land, bringing further shame on Jacob. This unpacking of Dina's story teaches us some things about our sister, that she is an extension of Jacob. Whether she is raped or not, this is a story about Jacob. Dina, daughter of Leah and Jacob, is victim to the circumstances of her life, and she is victim a second time to the needs of storytellers to frame the story of Jacob so that the myth of racial purity is preserved. Remember, these ancestral stories, like all biblical stories, contribute to a communal identity of the people who preserve and propagate these traditions. Think about this. Simeon and Levi kill all the men. That's pretty unlikely <laughs> that they would kill all of the men and then the brothers would loot and pillage the entire land. It's exaggerated violence. It's the kind that is observed in the stories of people who feel powerless. This is a story to inform a particular identity, generations past and present. It would not be fitting for an ancestress to marry this outsider and we will not tolerate our great ancestor Jacob being shamed in this way. So Dina learns a lesson, and her story teaches a lesson. And now we need to just step back one more time and observe that this carefully constructed story that is designed to create and shape identity is told under the shadow of the storyteller's trauma. The need to establish, maintain, and preserve identity is fueled in part by the community's own extended and significant suffering. 
the trauma of being a wilderness people, and then an exiled people, and then in the diaspora. This story reflects the anguish and fear of a people who struggle to survive, and the traumas of the community, is, the trauma of the community is imprinted on the story in the same way that trauma imprints and shapes or changes our DNA. So in the story of Dina, and in our current context, we have identity structures that rely on the subjugation of others in order to work. An intersectional reading of Dina's story invites us to see levels of victimization that are instructive for our current context. To what extent will our drive to construct a communal identity require that we sacrifice some of our own along the way? And how does Israel's own experience as a traumatized people inform their construction of identity in their stories? Does the drive to construct an identity of ethnic and religious purity mean that Dina must be sacrificed in much the same way that the construction of white superiority comes at the price of black humanity? Moreover, how does the trauma inflicted on black people make its mark in our communities of faith? Are y'all with me? Okay. So this dynamic of constructing an identity out of trauma is palpable in the African American communities and in the black church because we have a community that has not consistently engaged in recovery from the trauma of slavery. So here I want to reference um, Kelly Brown Douglas's foundational work. Um, this is one of those books I call an oldie but goodie. It, it still speaks to our current situation, sexuality in the black church. All right. Like Dina, African American sexuality served a function within the dominant white culture. Douglas argues that the violation of black sexuality by white culture is about nothing less than preserving white power in an interlocking system of racist, classist, sexist, and heterosexist oppression. Americans came to this country, European Americans came to this country as Irish, Italian, English, French, and somehow went through the presto changeo and became white. This often involved a name change. The creation of white as a category and the development of white supremacy had to be justified by a concept of black inferiority. When the justification of slavery could no longer be supported on the grounds of religion, because too many slaves became Anglicans, the construct of whiteness, <laughs> that's what happened, the construct of whiteness was called upon. Blacks became subhuman, inferior, and animal-like and now think about how that then um, causes their sexuality to become a point of obsession for those who sought to maintain the superiority of the constructed white race. The construct of whiteness can only exist in opposition to non-whiteness. And so Douglas argues white society needed to control black sexuality, meaning their bodies and reproductive capacities, so as to control them as people. It was also necessary to impugn black sexuality in order to suggest that black people are inferior beings. Now hear that statement and know that that could be used to describe Dina's context. Men in the ancient Near East needed to control women's sexuality, meaning their bodies and reproductive capacities, so as to control them as a people. It is also necessary to impugn women's sexuality in order to suggest that women are inferior beings. An intersectional reading of Dina's story holds in, in tension the construct that seeks to control Dina's sexuality as a woman, and the construct of identity that needs to control Shechem's sexuality as an outsider, and the construct of identity that doesn't even acknowledge Dina's sisters, all of this in service to this identity. 
In the same way that the Israelite community worked and works carefully to create an identity that is in many ways a response to trauma, those of us of the African diaspora in the black church find ourselves engaged in the work of constructing identity. Our response to black body as spectacle, black men as on one hand possessing great sexual prowess and on the other hand as predator, black woman as sexually promiscuous or mammy, and our history of physical and sexual exploitation has left us struggling to literally remember ourselves. We struggle to remember who we were before we were signified, and we attempt to reclaim core values that incorporate our African ancestors' celebration of being a part of the created order and the Judeo-Christian God of creation and Exodus and Jesus. This is the work of the black church, but it is messy work because once you have been othered, the desire to reproduce othering so as to increase your own sense of power resides within you. I want to read a little section no, I'll, I think I'll do that at the end. Um, let's go back to the verse that I lifted up at the beginning of the lecture, where Jacob is grieving the loss of his son, Joseph. His grief is misplaced because Joseph isn't dead. But he should be grieving. Are the dynamics that drove his other sons to behave in the way that they did? What he should be doing is repenting of participating in a culture where his daughters, named and unnamed, are relegated to the sidelines. Whereas the Israelite culture was subject to shame-honor dynamics, the African-American culture, and particularly the black church, struggles under the weight of the politics of respectability. So great is the desire to walk away from all of the terrible things that have been placed upon us that we have actually put ourselves in some other binds. Binds that keep us from embracing all of Dina's other sisters. Um, We need to engage in the work of recovery that is pervasive in educated, blue-collar, middle-class, upper-middle-class, and upper-class communities in this exercise of respectability politics. The concept that we can somehow earn our way out of these significations that have been placed upon us. And that a part of that work means ignoring those who do not have access. That we worship the nuclear heterosexual family. And we ignore Dina's sisters and brothers. And the poison here is that the politics of respectability means that on some level we have actually internalized the signification in much the same way that Leah and Rachel engage in a contest between themselves to produce sons for a community that does not really care about them. The work of wholeness, the work that we are called to do is womanist work. It strives towards a world where all of us are affirmed as blessed and whole creations of God. It means that in the black church, we are going to have to acknowledge that if we don't want to say that we have rape culture, that we at least have to acknowledge there are rape pockets. There are pockets where 
behavior takes place that needs to be named and challenged. If we want to be whole, we have to name where we are complicit. Why did this situation with R. Kelly go on for as long as it did? Now, I can give you at least two reasons. So one reason is low-hanging fruit. We can all say, as people of color, that if R. Kelly had um, a proclivity for Caucasian girls, this thing would have been shut down a long time ago. But it is also the case that if the black church had been more active, this thing could have been shut down a long time ago. We are complicated. We are victims and oppressors. And the fact of the matter is that many of the girls who were subject to um, his predatory behavior um, came from single parent households of a certain socioeconomic class that did not pass the paper bag test of respectability politics. Womanist work is messy work. And it is exhausting work. But it is life giving. Now I want to close with um, a passage from Toni Morrison's Beloved that I think speaks to the challenge that we face in um, the black church as people who have been um, signified, particularly physically, that the work of wholeness is the work of celebrating our embodiment, honoring our embodiment in all of its beautiful manifestations. After sitting herself on a huge flat-sided rock, baby Suggs bowed her head and prayed silently. The company watched her from the trees. They knew she was ready when she put her stick down, and then she shouted, let the children come, and they ran from the trees toward her. Let your mothers hear you laugh, she told them, and the woods rang. The adults looked on and could not help smiling. Then, let the grown men come, she shouted. They stepped out one by one from among the ringing trees. Let your wives and your children see you dance, she told them, and the ground life shuddered under their feet. Finally, she called the women to her. Cry, she told them, for the living and the dead, just cry. And without covering their eyes, the women let loose. It started that way, laughing children, dancing men, crying women and then it got mixed up. Women stopped crying and danced. Men sat down and cried. Children danced, women laughed, children cried until exhausted and riven, all had each lay about the clearing damp and gasping for breath. And in the silence that followed, baby Suggs, wholly offered up to them her great big heart. She did not tell them to clean up their lives or to go and sin no more. She did not tell them they were blessed of the earth, its inheriting meek, or its glory, brown, glory bound pure. She told them that the only grace they could have was the grace they could imagine. That if they could not see it, they would not have it. Here she said, in this place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in the grass. Love it. Love it hard. Yonder, they do not love your flesh. They despise it. They don't love your eyes. They'd just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder, they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them, pat them together, stroke them on your face because they don't love that either. You got to love it. You. And no, they ain't love, they ain't love with your mouth. <laughs> Yonder out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream from it, they do not hear. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give you leavings instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You gotta love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. 
Flesh that needs to be loved, feet that need to rest and to dance, backs that need support, shoulders that need arms, strong arms, I'm telling you, and oh, my people out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So love your neck. Put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs, you gotta love them. That dark, dark liver, love it, love it. And the beat and beating heart, love that too. Thank you. You may be seated. So we do have a few minutes um, this evening. If there are any questions that you have for Dr. Fentress Williams, or perhaps just uh, something that is speaking in your heart based upon this very powerful presentation. I am mic'd and I know, oh, thank you. We have a mic, perfect which Maurice has. Um, and so we want to make sure that those persons who are seeing this via the video stream will be able to hear as well. Is there anyone who um, has a question or a comment at this time? Yes, uh, can you, hold on one second, please. No, I think we need it for the taping. Thank you very much. It's grateful that my wife encouraged me to come and be here. And I was holding back tears as I am right now. The whole time I was hearing you speak, you're a friend. You're a person I've seen many times. I see you in church. I've been to your home. You've shared scripture that I was familiar with, some not so familiar with, but the, the le level of, of teaching that I received in this time, I, I can barely contain myself, and I'm so, so grateful. Um, I, I, I have been blessed. My, my mother-in-law's 90th birthday we celebrated this past weekend. And um, there was a time where all the husbands of her children were asked to speak and say something about her mother. And all I could do was thank her for producing this woman um, who, uh, it sounds strange for me to say this, but um, I, I prayed for a Proverbs 31 woman. Uh, and I stopped dating. And the moment I saw this woman, I knew I was going to marry her. And... Um, from that moment till this moment, 24 years later, I knew I made the right decision. But um, I've always appreciated this woman, my mother as well, and women in general, but never as much as this moment. So I feel guilty. I feel blessed. I feel enlightened. I'm just so very, very grateful. So I just wanted to thank you. 
and I'll leave it at that. Eagles, thank you. So Dr. Finches Williams, as well. <laughs> You raised this um, issue with us not having language always to speak to things. Mm. Um, in my work, I, I noticed that I began to have conversations with women after the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, <gasps> where women said, things happened to me when I was in college, yeah. and I didn't have language for mm -hmm. it. But today, I know that it was sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And I've really struggled to be with them and what it means to have to rethink an entire yeah. narrative. What does it mean to That's now right. suddenly see oneself as a sexual survivor, That's right. assault survivor when you didn't before? That's and right. so, so I guess my question is, you know, is that language, discovering that language always helpful? Um, <laughs> and can we read back onto history, the, the yeah. language of today. I don't yeah. know if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I mean, so um, I'm gonna give you an answer based on what I know today and what I think today. I think ultimately it is, it help, yes, it does help to have the language. It, it can be painful, um, but the, the, those um, opportunities for self-discovery um, make the world um, larger, um, help us to understand our own complexities. Um, I, I remember um, clearly the day I realized or recognized someone was treating me differently because I was a woman. It had never, I was black. I mean, that was enough. It had mm. never occurred to me, <laughs> like that whole sexism, that was not my thing. I was like, and but then, so, and it was kind of a painful moment because then I had to go back and say, well, wait a minute, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I do think that all of that, um, invites us to be fully human, all of it, yeah. And to do the work then of holding on to that and the work of recovery and the work of healing, um, yeah, yeah. Perhaps one more, if there's one more uh, comment or question. Oh, there's two, one here and then this young lady will be the last one. We'll start with you. Thanks so much. I'll be bold. As, all, as usual, Dr. Fendris Williams, awesome presentation as every time I've heard you in the past. And uh, being a male who's been in the black church for 58 years, uh, certainly I confess the, uh, the verbiage and actions that uh, exacerbate toxic masculinity and rape culture. If you would, uh, in a moment, just expound a little bit more on the culpability of the black church for not shutting down R. <laughs> Kelly and that type of... Is everybody chuckling? Uh, and, and actually, I'm, I'm, I'm very serious. I'm, I'm really not making light of it. I mean, I've been one who for a long time has been, you know, an opponent of, you know, radio stations and whatnot, mm -hmm. continuously publicizing, especially some of the lyrics or the types yeah. of tunes, knowing yeah. the history of uh, yeah. sexual misconduct yeah. with minors, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, um, Kevin, are you an elder now? This is Elder Kevin Agee in the CME Church. We have a variety of denominations here, so I just want to recognize that. And I've known um, Reverend Agee for many years. Um, so the, the, so um, I found out about the R. Kelly thing because my daughter made me watch the documentary. That's when I found out. So this was new to me, and, I, and her question to me was why aren't there an army of black mothers standing outside of his house? Mm. And that's when I started to get, why aren't, why? And that's um, when I started talking about it, when I would go to work with church groups and raise this question and begin to hear what other people were thinking. I think there's this, here's the part that's complicated. And this is why I like this, um, this concept of intersectionality because African Americans, um, in kind of group think have the trauma of men, primarily men, but also women being lynched, of fearing for our sons, of police brutality, um, all, so we have this kind of group think around, we have to protect our men. 
which sometimes spills over into situations like this. And it gets complicated because what are we supposed to do here? Are we supposed to protect our men or are we supposed to protect our women, mm. our daughters? And so I think th that's what caused some confusion there. I think it was exacerbated, as I said, by the fact of the kind of girls many of them were, and the kinds of families they came from. And it kind of showed the, the, the classism and hierarchy that exists in our own communities. Um, so um, this was an important moment for us to kind of um, come to terms with, with that. And I, yes, it, it's complicated, but I think it's an opportunity for us to deal with that, that messy situation. Yeah. And we have the last comment from this young woman. Is this on? Yes. <laughs> I wanted to thank you so much. As a survivor of sexual assault, it is always affirming of my humanity, and I'm sure yes. the humanity of others, knowing that God has something to say about oh, it. Yeah. So thank yeah. you so much. Um, you explained so wonderfully how oftentimes in the black community, there are black respectability politics. Mm. And in order for people to earn certain spaces and places of power, that oftentimes falls on the further subjugation and oppression of people. Yes. And what you have done today takes so much courage and so much self-awareness. So what advice would you give to ministers who want to speak truth to the powers that be, mm. but know that at, but know that in a real way they may not earn their space in particular places because of respectability politics. Yeah. So, so I'm older now, so I feel, I, f I feel freer in some ways. I mean, you know, my kids are out of the house. If I do something crazy, it'll be weeks before they hear about it. I mm. think. And, and I say that as someone who kind of, you know, I was born in 1962. Um, I was one of the few black students in my church, in my school. I was black respectability. Mm. You know, I knew how to speak. I knew how to answer the phone, all of it. Um, and at this point in my life, I want to be authentically embodied. I want that for my children. I want that for everyone, people I love and people I don't like. I want us to understand um, the power of being fully present in the body God gave you with all of its stuff. That there's power that we don't have access to when we don't um, fully embrace what we are as um, God's creation. I, I think there, depending on your context, there's a price to pay for that. And so then, and that's why this whole concept of womanist um, hermeneutics and saying, I'm coming in with all of me, and if we're lucky, that changes the atmosphere. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> So as we prepare to conclude this evening, um, I want to introduce and invite uh, the Reverend Canon Paula Clark to please come forward. Uh, Paula is a native Washingtonian. She currently serves as the Canon to the Ordinary for the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. And she began serving at the diocesan level in 2013, uh, again, with the Diocese of Washington. Uh, prior to her service at this level, she served congregations in Washington and in Maryland. She is a 2004 graduate of VTS, and before that had over 15 years of executive management experience in a variety of sectors. And I also want to say that she is currently on the slate of candidates to be the next bishop of the Diocese of Michigan. So please know that we are praying with you and for you. Thank you, Thank you yes. so much. Good evening, church. Good evening. 
It is so wonderful to be here this evening with all of you from so many different places and spaces of the VTS community and beyond, and so many people here who have walked with you, Dr. Fentress Williams, through so many parts of your life. And the real thing is, is that you have blessed so many of us. You have sold yourself short when you said you are now embodying that womanist, audacious, courageous, love all folks and herself person. You have always been that person. And you've taught us how to do that. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of privilege with um, permission and invite all of the VTS um, alums to come forward. All of us love you, but I was asked. <laughs> Especially the black alums as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh my, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Uh -huh. You have impacted this BTS community in ways that cannot be expressed fully. I, I don't know why um, Bishop-elect Rofe asked me to do this, but I can give a little testimony. I happened to be here when you first got here, and I can say that you made an impression from the very beginning, and not even from me, my t then 10-year-old daughter, who's now 27, I was working in the um, gym, pressed her face up against the window and said, oh, Mommy, there's a black family here! Because <laughs> there really wasn't. And we had been waiting with bated breath for you to come. And I would dare say, some of us, precede me, may have been praying for you to come. And God brings us some awesome blessings, and you are among them. And so I want to ask Joe Thompson to come forward, and then for you to please come forward. She asked if she could hug everybody. <laughs> okay, we are mainly done. Uh huh. No, I was going to pray. <laughs> Absolutely. So you can hug everybody because there'll be a line going all night. Huh? The rest of the story about that day when we met you and I said hello to you, and you said you have now met 50%. Oh, <laughs> Tell that part okay. of the story. I left out the part where when I met Dr. Fentress Williams, she said, and now you have met 50% <laughs> of, the black <laughs> of the black students. <laughs> We've come a long there way, are baby. <laughs> there are two. Yes, yes. So um, we will give you an opportunity to um, hug and say, and for us to say thank you to you in the whole. But right now, we'll close out our evening, and um, which has been such an awesome evening um, with prayer. So let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for the blessings that we've received this evening. We thank you for the blessing of this awesome lecture and presentation on Dinah and her sisters, especially in light of the Me Too movement and 
the black church. Lord, we give you thanks for this community that allows us to gather and speak frankly in an embodiment of who we are in all of our awesomeness and all of our brokenness. Lord God, bless us and bless especially your servant, the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams, for all that she is and all she's given and all she is yet to give, all the love that she has spread and all the knowledge that she has imparted. We just give you thanks, Lord God. And bless each of us as we are able to imagine grace. Lord God, we can't go anywhere unless we can imagine the grace. So bless us, keep us, strengthen us, and fortify us for all the work that we have ahead of us. Bless us in all that we do and all that we aspire to do. And give us safe passage this evening and a restful night, ready and awake and empowered to do all that you have given us to do. We ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. I've been asked to let everybody know, to remind everybody that if you had any trouble hearing tonight, this has been recorded. It is on the website. You can go back and catch anything that you missed. Go in peace. <laughs>